Well, good evening, everybody. And thank you for being with us this evening as we are about to start our fourth webinar out of the five series that we have put together through the Collaborative Alliance for Pancreatic Education and Research, the CAPER Academy for 2020. My name is Dr. Maisam Abu El Haija, and I am a pediatric pancreatologist, associate professor of pediatrics at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. And I have the pleasure to be your moderator for this evening. So a couple of housekeeping items are that when you are um, asking a question, you can do so. And that is through the chat function where you can post questions throughout the lecture. Please note that everybody can see your question. And if you would like to be unmuted, you can raise your hand and ask to be unmuted as well to ask the question yourself. We will leave these towards the end of our talks tonight. I would like to point to your attention that our last but not the least final session would include two great talks. The first one would be an overview of, a, overview of acute pancreatitis and that is gonna be presented by Dr. Anna Phillips from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And then it would be on surgical therapies in pancreatic disorders by Dr. Catherine Morgan from the Medical University of South Carolina. So that would be for next Thursday at 8 p.m. I hope as many of you can join us. For tonight's faculty, I have the pleasure and the honor of presenting our speakers. The first talk will be Imaging Modalities of Pancreatic Disorders and it will be presented by Dr. Tamil Turkis, and he is Associate Professor of Radiology at the Department of Radiology and Imaging Sciences, Indiana University School of Medicine, and he does chair a couple of committees in our field, including the Pancreatitis Panel and Society of Abdominal Radiology Committee, and um, the Imaging Committee and the Chronic Pancreatitis uh, Consortium. This would be followed by our next speaker, and our next talk, Pancreas Cysts, and the speaker would be Dr. Shunak Majumder from uh, Mayo Clinic. Dr. Majumder is Assistant Professor of Medicine at the Division of Gastroenterology Hepatology Mayo Clinic, and he is also involved in the Advanced Fellowship Program in their own institution, as well as other projects. So without um, further ado, I would like to turn the time and um, to the first speaker, Dr. Temel Turkis. Good evening, everybody. I'm Temel Turkis. Thank you for the introduction, Mason, and thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to present uh, here tonight. And uh, I'm a radiologist at Indiana University, and I've been uh, focusing on pancreatic uh, disorders, specifically chronic pancreatitis, for some time. And uh, tonight, my topic is more uh, simple and uh, broad, uh, basically imaging modalities of um, all pancreatic disorders as much as I can fit in 20 minutes. So we are gonna talk about the pancreatic neopla neoplasms. Uh, as you know, these can be cystic, solid, or mixed cystic uh, neoplasms. We'll be discussed separately by Dr. Majinder, so I will skip that section. And then we'll talk about pancreatic ductal anatomy and variants. And we'll briefly talk about acute, chronic, and autoimmune pancreatitis. And uh, then we'll, uh, I will briefly mention about the impact of MRCT in clinical practice. We'll show some images of postoperative uh, the findings by MRI. And then also we'll give a glimpse of the future, what is MRI and MR imaging of the pancreatitis is going through and also new uh, studies are coming up, emerging information about importance of pancreatic fat. As you know, in radiology, we mostly do CT. Uh, most of our uh, workload is CT, but we also do MRI and MRCT, especially for uh, pancreatic ductal problems. Ultrasound is not usually commonly used in the Western medicine, but it is very common in uh, Asia, actually. They do a lot more ultrasound in Asia, also, also in uh, the Europe, but not in the United States. We go straight to the CT or sometimes even straight to the MRI. And medicine is also available to us whenever there is a question of 
uh, the neoplasm versus not. So I'm going to start with an ultrasound image. Um, this is, um, you can say, what am I looking at here? And I will tell you the same thing. Uh, this is actually a pancreas ultrasound. And in a patient with acute pancreatitis, uh, all you are seeing in this uh, snowstorm appearance is a peripancreatic fluid, basically, in a patient with acute uh, pancreatitis. But you really cannot make up where the pancreas is. The main reason for that is this patient has, has a lot of subcutaneous fat and pancreas is located deep in the abdomen. Therefore, the sound beams do not penetrate as deep as possible. And uh, therefore, you get really limited anatomical detail. So definitely not a first line image unless you're dealing with a pediatric patient. You do not want to CT every pediatric patient. But in adults, uh, you probably don't have a lot of use for ultrasound. So let's start with solid pancreatic uh, neoplasm uh, in famous pancreatic adenocarcinoma. This is one thing that I do not want to have. And uh, we see a lot of these patients at IU. And typically, pancreatic adenocarcinoma appears as a hypo, relatively hypo enhancing mass compared to the normal pancreatic tissue. And in this case, unfortunately, it is invading the transverse mesocolon. So very easy to start invading the local structures like mesocolon. Uh, duodenum or superior mesenteric vein, et cetera. So it is relatively hypo-intense compared to the pancreas parenchyma. Whenever you see something uh, hypo-intensely enhancing, you should worry about a pancreatic cancer or edema or something else. Uh, this is an axial MR image, by the way. And then uh, pancreatic cancer typically causes uh, abductal obstruction. And it is, an, it is considered an early sign. Uh, for example, it is uh, causing ductal dilatation here, although you do not really see a pancreatic mass yet. There is no clear cut mass, but any ductal dilatation should uh, warn the radiologist uh, or anybody that there may be a malignancy or stricture due to chronic pancreatitis. It should be further evaluated. And in terms of the local invasion, uh, if the uh, pancreatic cancer is causing less than 180 degree uh, abutment of the vessel, then it is only an abutment. But if it is uh, abutting more than 180 degrees, then it is considered invasion. This makes the surgical sector much less likely. It's not impossible. Another thing, finding that we see on the pancreatic adenocarcinomas here is in high for intense mass again it causes teardrop shape deformation of the superior mesenteric vein. Again, it can be helpful when differentiating chronic pancreatitis uh, or a mass forming autoimmune pancreatitis from pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Unfortunately, in about 10% of the adenocarcinomas, the, the lesions are highly intense to pancreas on CT and MRI, which makes it really difficult to uh, detect the pancreatic cancer. A lot of people, you know, say, why do radiologists miss this pancreatic cancer? Because it was not visible. And uh, a lot of times the pancreatic cancer is small size as well at the time of diagnosis. So we would have to pay attention when uh, dealing with the pancreatic cancer. And this is a case of uh, double duck sign. Uh, but in this case, there was actually a useful imaging feature called duck penetrating sign here. I don't know if you can appreciate this tiny little duct is actually a continuation of the main pancreatic duct. This has been described as uh, a possible indicating of a chronic pancreatitis rather than a pancreatic cancer causing double duct sign. So apart from the hypovascular, I'm sorry, hypoenhancing mass like uh, uh, the pancreatic cancer, adenocarcinoma, there are also hypervascular pancreatic masses. And typically, these are metastases, and most commonly being the renal cell carcinoma. And as you know, renal can, uh, the kidneys are very nearby pancreas, and they are communicating directly with each other through the anterior perirenal space. And it is not uncommon to see pancreatic metastases from RCC. Other hypervascular pancreatic masses are neuroendocrine tumor and pancreatic splenule, which is ectopic splenic tissue within the pancreas. The MRI can be really helpful for this one. 
And then solid sclerosis adenomas can also be hypervascular if they are predominantly solid. So here's an interesting case this time, pancreatic lymphoma, primary pancreatic lymphoma. It is unusual and also not that easy to detect. Uh, it can appear in multiple different uh, uh, features. It can be a diffuse enhancing an endometrial gland, which may be difficult to detect or say that this is back from the pancreatic lymphoma. And here's another uh, case of pancreatic lymphoma. This time it doesn't show any inflammation, but diffuse enlargement of the gland is seen. And is another pancreatic lymphoma. It looks uh, bizarrely large and necrotic, and it veins the colon and other structures as well. So this is uh, hard to diagnose uh, preoperatively or pre-biopsy. Uh, in a case like this, you definitely wonder about malignancy. And uh, you can either do biopsy or a PET scan and then show that this pancreas is diffusely abnormal and hypermetabolic. So let's skip the solid and pseudopapular tumor, which is a, a cystic mass with thick wall, or there may also be internal uh, masses or echogenesis. And uh, this was detected by ultrasound first and then that ended up with an MRI. This is a coronal T2 image showing a uh, same mass, which is T2 hyperintense, means there's a lot of fluid inside this lesion, and also internal architecture as well. Um, CT, you may also see chunky calcifications and intratumoral hemorrhage, uh, which is also common. Here's an axial CT image, shows that pseudo SPT, Again, inhomogeneously enhancing, these areas might be hemorrhagic or actually soft tissue. These areas might be necrotic and uh, better can, these features can be better evaluated with MRI. But whenever you see like this, you know that you, you're probably dealing with an aplasm. And uh, this could also be a cystic neuroendocrine tumor as well. Now, if this is a SPT, uh, patients will end up getting a resection because there's about 15% malignancy risk. Okay, now the, I will skip cystic neoplasm, so Dr. Majinder is going to talk about it. And uh, let's switch to postoperative imaging and complications. We do a lot of Whipple procedure at uh, IU for pancreatic cancer and uh, chronic pancreatitis. There are three uh, important anastomoses when imaging the Whipple patients. So first, um, anastomosis here can be depicted as hepaticojejunostomy with a green arrow. Then there is a pancreatic uh, body to jejunum anastomosis, pancreaticojejunostomy, and uh, the third anastomosis is gastrojejunostomy depicted by this red arrow here. This is a Typical appearance in a uh, post Whipple patient. These are this is an MRCT image. These two are uh, T2 weighted images without fat suppression. As you can see, fat is bright. And on the coronal image, uh, you can see the common bile duct. On MRCT image, you can see the common bile duct better because it's a thicker image. You see a lot more intrahepatic ducts. And then here is the anastomosis between the common hepatic duct and a small bowel loop. This is actually a jejunum that is brought up all the way to the liver pineum. So this anastomosis can be easily seen by uh, MRCT image or even a coronal uh, T2 image. And then the third image on the right is axial and it shows the remnant of the pancreas. And this gray signal is from the adjacent small bowel. And this is the pancreatic jejunostomy anastomosis. So with MRI, we can really evaluate in detail uh, the status of the, the Whipple procedure. We see complications uh, and oftentimes uh, patients do fine, but sometimes there can be problems with the surgery, such as in this case, and this is a small bowel loop. This is an MRCP image, a small bowel loop. You can see the intrahepatic duct joining the small bowel. There is no problem there. But clearly, there is this connection of the pancreatic duct, which is dilated, and the small bowel. This was a stricture at the pancreatic urgeogenostomy anastomosis. The second case here is also 
picture at anastomosis, but also in addition to that, there was an intraluminal thinning defect and uh, as well as ductal dilatation of the pancreas. And the third image is not from a Whipple procedure, but it's from a central pancreatectomy. As you can see, the central part of the pancreas is missing. And in these patients, there is one anastomosis between the upstream or tail pancreatic duct to do small bowel again, but in this case, it is also dilated. You can see the ecstatic branches and dilatation relative to the downstream pancreatic duct. This was a stricture of the upstream pancreatic duct. All right, let's shift gears to congenital malformations. It is very common actually in the pancreas and the gastroenterologist would like to know if patient has divisum or something else going on before he goes in and do the ERCP or endoscopic ultrasound. And MRCP is the primary modality now. It has replaced ERCP for diagnostic purposes. And here's a case of complete pancreas divisum. This is the main pancreatic duct draining into the duodenum via major, um, so minor papilla, whereas the camobile duct and then the, the remnant other pancreatic duct is draining into the duodenum via the major papilla. And this sacular dilatation at the end of the main pancreatic duct is called Santorina seal, and it is commonly seen with uh, pancreas division patients. There are a variety of pancreas uh, division. It can be complete, like this case, or it can be incomplete, or that can be accessory duct, etc. These are described in the literature. Another anomaly that is not uh, common but can be seen is anomalous pancreatic obedia junction. In this case, uh, as depicted in this image, the pancreatic duct and the camobile duct communicate with each other. This is due to a long common channel. And without, if the, the duct, there was no long common channel, all of the area would be covered with the sphincter. But in case of a long channel, the sphincter doesn't cover entirely. And as can, can be seen in the MRCP image, there can be reflux of the pancreatic juice into the camobile duct. These patients are often diagnosed at early stage due to symptoms and they uh, undergo surgery because there is risk of developing malignancy or other complications uh, due to reflux of the pancreatic juice. Colodocal cysts, there are different types. I'm showing you the three colodocal cysts here, which is a circular dilatation or cystic dilatation at the terminal portion of the common bile, um, common bile duct. This is typically seen within the duodenal wall and it is also seen by the ERCP image on the right side. It looks very similar to the MRCP image. Anello pancreas is also uh, relatively common compared to the other anomalies. And this fish eye thing looking here is actually duodenum, which is very compressed due to surrounding pancreatic tissue. This is not the normal configuration, as you know. Normally, the pancreas should end here but during, due, due to a problem in the, you know, the embryogenic, embryogenesis and the pancreas uh, encircles the duodenum, and this can result in gastric outlet obstruction in pediatric population and some other symptoms in adult population as well. So we can still see this finding in adults as well. All right, let's go to pancreatitis. We'll talk about acute chronic and autoimmune pancreatitis. One of the most common things that you read in our reports is pancreatic fluid collection, right? So they revised the pancreatic uh, Atlantic classification. They changed the names a little bit about five, six years ago, I believe. And uh, the, the name of the collection is different if it is an interstitial versus necrotic pancreatitis. And it's also different if the age of the duration of acute pancreatitis is less than four weeks or after four weeks. So in a case like this, which is a, I mean, acute pancreatitis with fluid collection, as you can see, the pancreas diffusely enhances. There's no lack of enhancing parenchyma. Therefore, this is probably interstitial pancreatitis. And uh, the, the pancreatitis, let's say, was only last week, so this would be an acute pancreatic fluid collection. In a case like this, again, a CT image, of course, and you see lack of enhancement within the pancreatic parenchyma. 
These parts are enhancing, but these are not. This is an equitizing pancreatitis. And this jar, large giant fluid collection, let's say it was uh, less than four weeks again, will be called acute necrotic collection. It is compressed in the stomach here because it is really large. Probably a lot of pancreatic juices leaking out of the necrotic parenchyma. It even extends into the pericolic gutter here. After four weeks, we see this uh, collection, which has a thick wall now, thick enhancing wall. And uh, we look at the original image. It, it is not an equitizing pancreatitis. So this will be called pseudocyst now. Interstitial pancreatitis, fluid collection after four weeks is pseudocyst. I will talk more about the complications of acute pancreatitis because we see these almost in every pancreatitis case, unfortunately. It is not something that uh, should be uh, overlooked. So here's a fluid collection. This is the pancreas here. This is the fluid collection, which turns out has air bubbles in it. So whenever you see air bubbles in a peripancreatic collection, you should be suspicious about two things first. One of them is infection. Will there be a super infection within the collection? Second thing is fistula to the bowel. So you should really look at the axial coronal sagittal images, see where these fluid collections are going into. And here in this case, this was the descending colon here. And you can clearly see that the, the descending colon is communicating with the collection and pouring out a lot of gas forming bacteria outside. So this was a fistula to the colon. And it, this was confirmed with a gastrographin enema. This is the gastrographin within the descending colon. It, is showing this leak, which is visible on the CT. And not only the bowel, but there are also vascular complications. Commonly, the splenic artery and vein uh, gets affected. They uh, may be occluded. Uh, typically, SMV gets occluded in after several, uh, you know, the acute pancreatitis episodes. One of the hepatic uh, splenic artery complication is pseudoaneurysm, which can be seen here. Uh, radiologists uh, should look really carefully. The size of the splenic artery should be uniform from the spleen all the way to the ciliac trunk. If you see a focal dilatation like this, it's going to be a pseudoaneurysm and it should be embolized uh, by the intervention radiology. This is a pancreatic collection again. Interestingly, you don't even see the pancreas in this case because it was really a severe uh, necrotizing pancreatitis. There can be ductal complications as well in the acute pancreatitis. And uh, here's an MRCP image, coronal, coronal image showing you the pancreatic duct and the common bile duct. And as you can see here on the before the secretin, you do not see the connection of the pancreatic duct in the segment. In addition, there is a fluid collection here right next to that area. So you wonder whether there is something leaking or not. And it could, be, it could be ductal disruption or complete disconnection of the pancreatic duct. After secretin, you can actually start seeing the pancreatic duct here in the missing segment that it is actually present. That means this is a pancreatic disruption rather than a disconnection. And this was visible after the administration of secretin. Another value added by MRI in cases of acute pancreatitis, you can see the uh, communication of this uh, fluid collection with the pancreatic duct here. So you can better depict the uh, fluid collections and also pancreatic duct and the communication between the two. Same is true for the pancreatic cystic neoplasms as well. All right, so MRI and MRCP plays a fundamental role in the non-invasive investigation of many pancreatic, pancreatic, pancreatic biliary disorders. It is, as like I said, it has replaced ERCT uh, for the diagnostic purposes and because it is non-invasive and uh, it contains both MRI and MRC. We did a study at IU and asking the gastroenterologist, hey, MRCP is really helping you or not? And, and it turns out it really helps the gastroenterologist as you can see in these results, uh, there was before and after MRCP, there was much less, I mean, like 20 less ERCP was performed and about half 
the endoscopic ultrasound was performed after revealing the MRCT. And uh, the trip conservative therapy almost tripled. So we really changed the management of these patients. After uh, looking at the uh, MRCT or reading the report of the MRCT clinician changed uh, substantially or major changes to the management after reviewing the MRCT. So it really helps uh, gastroenterologists before going and seeing the patient or doing a procedure. And the difference between MRI on the left and the CT on the right, and you can see the cystic structure is much better on MRI compared to the CT. And you can see the internal structures within the cyst much better within the MRI because MRI has much better soft tissue contrast compared to CT. So it helps the radiologist to define or name the cystic collections uh, better than CT, but CT is all universal and it is a lot easier to perform. So CT is the first line but MR and MRCT uh, has roles as well. So one of the reasons that we prefer MRI is also looking at the, how much pancreatic tissue is still enhancing. You cannot really do this with CT, at least not easily, but in MRI it is quite simple. This image here is a pre-contrast T1, T1 image. These are the post-contrast subtraction images so you can you quickly doing a subtraction, you can eliminate the signal from the hemorrhage, peripancreatic fluid, et cetera. Just look at the enhancement within the pancreatic tissue. So these kind of tricks really helps uh, the radiologists and we like it. Another thing that you give during the MRCT is secretin. And as you can see in the pre-secretin post which is the pancreatic diameter significantly increases if you give secretin. This increases our diagnostic performance and makes a better diagnosis. And uh, in addition to that, uh, pancreas secretes a lot of fluid due to the effect of secretin, and we can assess the exocrine volume of the pancreas as well. And this can be the exocrine fluid can be decreased in patients with severe chronic pancreatitis. Downside of using a secretin is it adds about 15 minutes to the study, which is a long time in MRI, and uh, also adds a lot of cost, substantial increase in the cost of the MRCT. Here's a before and after secretin image. You can really see the difference between the pancreatic duct, and you can see a lot more side branch ducts. What are the indications in secretin? And you can uh, look at the evaluate the integrity of the pancreatic duct. You can look at the structure, stones, uh, estimate pancreatic exocrine volume better, differentiate side branch IPMR from other cystic neoplasms or pseudocyst. You can look at the patents of the anastomosis in post of patients, exocrine reserve, doctor dilatation, leaks, et cetera. And it depicts the pancreatic duct better, including the variance compared to the non secretin MRCT. All right, so that's it for the acute pancreatitis. And autoimmune pancreatitis is uh, less common, but it usually is shown on a, a CT as a diffuse and not. But the variations on the visualization can be seen. It could also cause a focal pancreatic mass in about one third of the patients. And typically when we see this capsular rim around the pancreas, we feel more comfortable that this is probably an autoimmune pancreatitis. In addition to the parenchymal changes, uh, autoimmune pancreatitis can also cause ductal changes, structures like this, and these typically respond to uh, steroid therapy. This is before steroid and after steroid therapy. Another thing that we see is GRU pancreatitis. This is typically another pancreatitis, but happens at the duodenal pancreatic junction here which results in a lot of complications, such as ductal structures, CBD obstruction, et cetera. Nobody exactly knows why blue pancreatitis happens at the pancreatic uh, duodenal junction, but uh, it is quite uh, intensive results. Like in this case, a lot of duodenitis, and then gallbladder inflammation, fluid, et cetera. All right, so chronic pancreatitis uh, is basically chronic inflammation of the 
uh, pancreas and a mild chronic pancreatitis you see minimal fibrosis but in severe chronic pancreatitis amount of fibrosis increases significantly and these purple cells are the acinar cells that remains in the pancreas so what we do what can we do in mri we can not only depict the pancreatic ducts, but also we can look at the pancreatic parenchyma in chronic pancreatitis patients. And for a ductal distortion or abnormalities, we can do uh, secretine enhanced or non enhanced MRCT. There, there's a decreased exocrine volume, we can detect that with secretin stimulation. If there is less cytoplasmic protein content, we can find out that the prolonged T1 relaxation time. And if there's an impaired diffusion of the fluid throughout the pancreas, we can detect that with diffusion restriction images, um, uh, DWI. And if there's decreased elasticity due to fibrosis, we can measure that stiffness with MR elastography. But typically, since the Cambridge classification only looks at the pancreatic ducts, we do MRCT and we uh, define the pancreatic ductal anatomy in MRCT. In this case, this is a pancreatic duct and common bile duct. There is clearly a broad delocation of the main pancreatic duct. And this was a patient, uh, this was a stricture in a patient with chronic pancreatitis. But if patient didn't have chronic pancreatitis, this could also be an introductal, uh, introductal mucinous neoplasm, main duct ITM, and so it should be obviated in, initially. One thing that MR cannot do is depict the calcium. So CT is uh, the modality. If you're looking for calcific pancreatitis, it can detect even the one millimeter uh, calculus. In this case, there was a pancreatic ductal calculus causing upstream dislocation. Uh, what are the new imaging modalities for chronic pancreatitis? There is a lot uh, going on uh, in this field because we want to add the pancreatic parenchyma in the diagnostic criteria for chronic pancreatitis, there's a multi-institutional study going on called MINIMAP. And uh, there, are, there are T1 weighted images, uh, T1 mapping, diffusion weighted imaging, extracellular volume fraction, MR elastography, T1 weighted Dixon images. All these new stuff is basically uh, looking into the pancreatic duct. And these four images are quantitative MRI, meaning that the value that you read from, from the MRI actually represents the tissue itself. So these are, uh, this is kind of a future of the MRI. This is what the T1 weighted gradient echo signal uh, or sig signal intensity ratio uh, is used. This is the pancreas, pancreatic body and tail. It looks very bright on the pre-contrast images, especially relative to the spleen. And in a patient with chronic pancreatitis, this Right signal is decreased, and we can measure this decrease by ratio, taking ratio of the pancreatic signal to the spleen and come up with signal intensity ratio. And we show that signal intensity ratio significantly correlates with the pancreatic juice uh, bicarbonate level and publish this. Basically, it is reflecting the pancreatic exocrine function. This is a T1 map image, uh, which is the quantitative MRI, as I mentioned. You, anything that you are measuring in the pancreas actually reflects the value. Therefore, this can be used from one institution to another institution. And here is a T1 map. This is a T1, T2 rated image, but it is being replaced by T1 map. In this case, you can depict the pancreas as blue here in a normal patient, whereas pancreas becomes red or yellow in a patient with Cambridge for chronic pancreatitis. This is due to prolongation of the T1 relaxation. Again, T1 uh, in a normal and T1 in a mild, mild chronic pancreatitis patient. ECV, unfortunately, I don't have time to describe the ECV, but it basically detects the extracellular volume in any organ, including pancreas. This is a normal patient, uh, normal pancreas is about 20% extracellular volume, whereas in chronic pancreatitis, this increases up to 40%. MR elastography of pancreas uh, might be coming soon. And this basically measures the tissue stiffness, as you know, commonly used for liver, but not being used for pancreas yet. It's experimental. We apply sound beams to the abdomen, and then we listen to the echo, and we end up with an image, images like this. Here's the pancreas, and we can measure the stiffness of the pancreas. So lastly, I'm going to talk about pancreatic fat. 
there, MRI is a very sensitive detection of tissue fat, and it can separate the tissues into fat only and water only, uh, you know, the fractions. And uh, in a fat only image, whatever you're seeing is coming from the fat signal. If it is dark, that means there's no fat in the organ, such as the pancreas in this case. And we can take the ratio and fat fraction coming from that organ. So why is that important? Because recently uh, we showed that pancreatic steatosis or amount of pancreatic fat is directly correlated with the visceral adipose. So it is part of metabolic syndrome. We know that hepatic steatosis is commonly associated with visceral adiposity, but nobody talks about the pancreatic steatosis. And if you look at the pancreatic steatosis, amount of pancreatic fat increasing, probability of type 2 diabetes is also increasing. So this is something to consider in type 2 diabetic patients and what is happening to the pancreas. That's it. I hope I wasn't speaking too fast and was able to help and give you some information. I'm looking forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Tamil. Um, really appreciate the info and the, and the beautiful images. Um, we're going to leave questions till the end. I'm taking notes of them. We'll move next to our speaker in the sake of time, Dr. Majumder from Mayo Clinic, who will talk to us about pancreas cysts. Shonak, the 